Five limits by direct substitution. We do what it says. We directly substitute into the equation. So I take this negative five, I put it in everywhere I, where I see x in an equation. When I'm just taking the limit of a constant like three, there's nowhere to plug in the x. So all that happens is the equation still is three because negative five didn't go in anywhere. It's basically saying that if y always equals three on a horizontal line at y equals three, what happens as I move along that line and go towards the value of x equals negative five? Well, it doesn't matter what x value. Everywhere along that line y equals three, you always are approaching the value of three because it never deviates from that straight line. When I go to do x plus two and I say, what's an approach when x approaches negative one? I put a negative one in where I see the two and it becomes negative one plus two, which equals positive one. So the limit approaches positive one. When I put in zero for x cubed minus three, it becomes zero cubed minus three, which is really zero minus three, or just negative three. So any of these direct substitution problems, I'm just taking the value, plugging it in wherever I see an x, and solving. Find the limits using properties of limits. So in each of these, I can just plug in when I'm asked to find f of x and g of x, but then you'll see it's a little trickier when I do these. So when I put in zero to f of x, f of x is x plus two, so it becomes zero plus two, which just equals two. When I put in two to g of x, it becomes x squared, which means that it's two squared, which gives me four. When I'm asked to do g of f of x as x approaches zero, I have to start with the innermost function. So I'm putting a zero in for f of x, which we found previously gave us an answer of two. That means this reduces to g of the answer to that inner function two, which we did here and found that g of two was two squared or four. That means the overall limit as x approaches zero, g of f of x is four. When we go the reverse way, we don't have those answers yet. So I need to first say, well, what happens when I put zero into the innermost function g of x? Well, then it becomes g of zero equals zero squared. Zero squared is just zero. So it reduces to f of the answer to the inner function zero, f of zero we did here and got an answer of two. So the final answer limit as x approaches zero of f of g of x is two. Notice these are different answers depending upon which order we do the functions, which one's the outer function and which one's the inner function. For question five, we're given, we don't even know what value x is approaching. It's just approaching some constant value, and at that constant value, the function approaches the value of 25. So what we're using is the rules of limits that basically say if it approaches something and then we take the root of f of x, it approaches the root of that something. So this really just becomes the root of 25, which we know to be 5. Here, when it says x approaches c, we're taking something divided by 10. When you take a function and divide it by a constant, it's the answer divided by that constant. So this becomes 25 divided by 10, which is really 2.5. When we square something, it's what we would have gotten to, quantity squared. So this becomes 25 squared, which is really 625. When we do something to the three halves, what that really is saying is cube the square root. I can do it in either order and we'll get to the same answer. If I cube it first, then square root it, it'll get me to the same place as square rooting it, then cubing it. The easier way here is square rooting first, then cubing, because I know what the square root of 25 is. The square root of 25 is five. If I then cube five, I would get five to the third power which would give me 125. The other way to see that would be to cube 25 to begin with. It would give me 625 times 25, which is a big number. <laughs> you know, I would say 1500 and then 150, so 1650. And I guess the root of 1650 is 125. Why don't I double check that real quick just to make sure I'm not telling lies. So if I do, 25 to the power of 3, 
it gets me to 15,625. The root of that answer is 125. So again, I get to the same place doing it either way. These types of problems, there's always some way to factor the bottom that will let me reduce with the top. If I just immediately tried to substitute in, I'd get zero over zero, which is the indeterminate case, and really doesn't tell me anything. So basically for all these problems, because the bottom equals zero, if I plug in the given value, it means that in the actual graph, there's a hole in the graph. There's a place that I can't go. But as far as limits are concerned, they don't care about that. They care about where am I headed towards, not where do I end up. So for that reason, if we factor out what can be factored, reduce, and then do our substitution, we'll find out where something was headed, even if it didn't really end up there. So we're gonna start by factoring the bottom of the equation. X squared minus six X has the common factor X that I can pull out. It leaves behind X squared divided by X is X. Negative six X divided by X is negative six. If I now reduce top and bottom by X, on top there's an understood one left behind, so I get an answer of one over x minus six. It still is the limit approaches x, or the limit as x approaches zero of this one over x minus six. Well, if I substitute and put the zero in, it becomes one over zero minus six, which equals one over negative six, or negative one sixth. That's the correct answer to this first problem. In the second problem, again, we can start by plugging in this negative two just to check that we get the indeterminate case. Negative two plus two gives me zero. Negative two squared gives me four. Minus four gives me zero. So I'm going to need to factor. On top, I already have this factor x plus two. On bottom, this is a difference of squares that factors to x plus two, x minus two, which means my repeated factor top and bottom is the x plus two. It leaves behind an understood one which gives me one over x minus two to plug in this negative two. Negative two goes in here and becomes one over negative two minus two, or one over negative four. Negative one fourth is the correct limit that this approaches. For the final one, again, if I put in the three, I'd get three minus three is zero. Nine minus six minus three is zero. I need to factor. On top, the x minus three, on bottom, it's a trinomial. I factor it as x and x. I see a negative sign, I put it here. This negative sign means different from the first sign, different from a negative is a positive. I'm looking for two things that multiply to three and subtract to two. That would be three and one. This is the repeated factor that goes away. It leaves me with one over x plus one. I wanna put in three where I see an x. So it becomes one over three plus one which is one-fourth as a final answer.